Did you choke all of the women? Yes, I did, yeah. Why did you choke them? That's what I had done with the first one, so I never changed. It had worked the first time, so I went to the second and third, fourth and fifth, sixth and seventh. I'm sorry it happened. Wish it never happened. And can we move on? Hey folks, Rex Heerman has a notorious serial killer sending him letters while he sits in jail awaiting his murder trial. And if you think that's strange, wait till you hear what Heerman had to say when he responded back. <laughs> can this case get any wackier? Hey, welcome to Profiling Evil, folks. The notorious murderer known as the Happy Face Killer is claiming that he wrote suspected Long Island serial killer Rex Heerman a letter while Heerman sits in jail. He's the man accused of murdering women on Gilgo Beach. And get this, he says Heerman responded. You got to hit the like and subscribe button on this one, folks. And make sure you're ringing that bell so that you get all of Profiling Evil's videos. And please, share us with your friends. Now, Keith Jesperson was dubbed the name the Happy Face Killer after this convicted serial killer started writing letters to police and the media, providing intricate details of his murders, all in an attempt to prove that he was the real kill killer in these cases. He was pretty darn upset that other people were getting credit for his murders. Now, you might think the idea would be to lay low if somebody else has taken the blame. But these serial killers are all about legacy, and he wasn't about to let somebody else get credit for something that he did. He's tied to eight known murders, although the guy boasted that he had nearly 160-plus victims during his murdering spree, something that nobody in the law enforcement community believes, and he's now recounted. But nonetheless, he said he was good for as many as 160 plus murders. One of the happy face murder victims was identified just this week, and we're learning a whole lot more about Jesperson's time behind bars. Now I'm going to come back to who this killer is in a minute, but we got to address the elephant in the room. And that has to do with whether or not the happy face killer is pen pals with accused Long Island serial killer Rex Heerman. Mm. Now, while Jesperson was being interviewed behind bars at the Oregon State Penitentiary last month, he shared a tidbit that investigators just flat weren't expecting. In the video recorded interview that he gave, Jesperson reportedly said that he wrote Accused killer in the Long Island serial killer case, Rex Heerman, a letter as Heerman sat in jail. Now, I don't know if this guy's trying to help people, if he perceives uh, that he's helping people who he thinks are his peers, or what it is that's motivating Jesperson, but he's made a habit of writing letters to suspected serial killers. In those letters that the happy face killer is sending to other suspected serial killers, he reminds them that police must have enough evidence to prove they, that the killer, the accused, has committed the crime. So they may as well confess. <laughs> well, in speaking of Heerman, the happy face killer said he recently got a letter from Rex Heerman, and in his response, he told Heerman just to confess. And here's the crazy part. He said that Heerman actually wrote him back and he said, I'll take it under advisement. <laughs> Holy cow. Can this thing get any crazier? Well, let's talk a little bit about Keith Jesperson, the person convicted as the happy face serial killer who just had one of his victims identified through this amazing science of genetic genealogy. The person who was identified, and this was 30 years later, is a woman named Suzanne Kellenberg. And she was 34 years old when Jesperson killed her. It, he killed her back in June of 1993. And her body would be found a short time later, about a month later, if I remember right, by a prison work crew who was working alongside Interstate 10 in Florida. Well, for the next 30 years, she remained a Jane Doe 
until our friends over at Othram matched her genetic profile and her identity was finally known. When investigators re-interviewed Jesperson last month, he told the investigators that he picked the woman up at a truck stop near Tampa, Florida, and he drove her to a rest area in the Florida Panhandle. So you can kind of see on this map the, the Panhandle heading off to the west in Florida. And there he parked in a parking lot alongside of a security guard. Now, I don't know if that was intentional as kind of a, I don't know, an exciting challenge for him, but it was there that he started to, I believe, assault Yellenberg again. And Kellenberg must have been fearful because she started screaming, according to Jesperson, and she wouldn't stop screaming. So to silence her, he choked her by pressing his fist down on her throat and tightening zip ties around her neck. You know, he didn't just happen to have those. Those were part of a planned fantasy, in my opinion. And uh, to say that it just happened is, is pretty bizarre to me. Now, he says he killed her because he wasn't allowed to have unauthorized riders in his truck. I'm going to let you weigh in on whether you believe that story or not. But he said he left the rest stop after he killed her, and he dumped her body alongside Interstate 10 a short time later. Well, now this killer is going to face additional charges in her death. And if convicted, it will add one more to the seven life sentences that he's currently serving for murders that he committed across the country. So I want to tell you a little bit about each of those murders, the murders of the happy face killer. But before I do, I want to pause for a second with Christmas rolling in and the holiday season and tell you a little bit about Profiling Evil Books. Now, many of you have purchased my books through our website, ProfilingEvil.com, or on Amazon. Well, I recently released a newly updated book called Predators, Who They Are and How to Stop Them. It's a book I wrote alongside my friend and mentor, FBI special agent and profiler, Greg Cooper. It's a great read, but I want to talk about my favorite books, which are Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult, and she knew no fear. Now Deceive chronicles my investigation into and the ultimate takedown of a ritual cult that was sexually abusing children. You know, there were more than 4,000 rapes of those children that occurred in a case that resulted in 12 people being convicted of child sex crimes. I wrote the book after some of the victims reached out to me 30 years later, asking me to tell their story. I want you to know I'm not profiting from the book and the proceeds are going toward building a new children's advocacy center, which you see pictured here. It is a place where children can be forensically and physically examined and prepared for the court system. And it's a place where they hopefully enter in with a lot of pain in their heart, but they exit a whole lot healthier and able to deal with what's happened to them. The center is set to break ground in November of this year, and I really hope you'll buy my book because the proceeds are going directly to help build that building. Now, you can help by purchasing uh, Deceived. The other book I want to talk about, though, is She Knew No Fear. It's the story of the murder of my great-great-grandmother, and the murder occurred on July 24th, 1891. Now, that's statehood day for Utah. I had heard about Jane from my grandfather all of my life, and as my law enforcement career was coming to an end, I thought to myself, wait a minute, I've spent an entire career investigating and solving cold cases. I wondered why I hadn't solved my very own relative's murder. And 130 years after she was shot to death, I solved the crime. I think you'd really enjoy the story and it would give you an opportunity to get a great Christmas gift for yourself or a loved one. Now I've priced this book at $30 for a signed hardbound copy of Jane and you can get it by emailing me directly at profilingevil at gmail.com and then I'll respond with some shipping and payment information. And we can also find out what you want the book to say in my personal inscription to you. But now, let's get back to today's video. It's the happy face killer that we're talking about. His name is Keith Hunter Jesperson. 
And this guy was born in 1955 in Canada. He was the middle child of five children, so seven in the family. He had younger brothers and older sisters. Reports suggest that his father was incredibly domineering and probably an alcoholic. He describes his home life as being very abusive, but his father denies the abuse. Now, in a book that was written, the author of that book also interviewed a bunch of other family members who supported Jesperson's claim that there was abuse in the home, though. As Jesperson grew, he was teased relentlessly about his large size. This was a big kid who became a huge man. At a very young age, he began taking pleasure in torturing animals. Now, there's been a lot of talk over the years about the homicidal triangle, which includes uh, fire starting and bedwetting and cruelty to animals. Some experts today say that's a whole bunch of junk and a whole bunch of junk science. But it seems to repeat itself over and over again as we look at these serial predators who commit serial homicide. The family moved from Canada to the United States to the state of Washington up in the northwest corner of the country where Jesperson continued his troubled youth. In fact, it's kind of interesting to me because as I looked at this and studied his life, as he became a teenager, he was, he was so large in the neighborhood as he was in his seven, eight year, nine, 10 year old age that the other kids in the neighborhood, including his brothers, started calling him Igor. Now that name stayed with him through his school years, adolescence, and into high school. Imagine how that hung on to him. He was described as a shy child who preferred to play by himself most of the time. Now, I don't know if he preferred to play by himself or he was so troubled by the way he was being treated that that caused him to be more of an an individual contributor. Now, this isolation led to incidents of misbehavior, which almost always resulted in his father punishing him severely. And in fact, at one point, his father apparently punished him by giving him an electrical shock. Now, Jesperson said it was from a high voltage line in the house, but his father later admitted that he shocked the boy, but he was only using a 12 volt battery to do so. Don't know, but either way, it really raises some interesting questions. It it also raises questions on whether his upbringing channeled his behavior toward violence and his obvious lack of empathy, or if he was just born that way. It's the old nurture versus nature question. And you can learn a whole lot more about that principle by listening to my videos on the topic in the Profiling Evil Academy series. Now, starting at about age five, Jesperson began capturing and torturing animals in the area. He reportedly enjoyed watching the animals suffer, and he found a great sense of power and control when he took their lives. Some reports suggest that it was about this time that uh, Jesperson started to see that this was one of the few ways he could get the, the uh, I don't know, the attention and maybe uh, some feeling of accomplishment because of the way his father responded. Well, as time went on, Jesperson started fantasizing about the feelings he experienced by torturing and killing these animals and wondered if it would be an even greater feeling if he were to kill a human being. In fact, by age 10, Jesperson started acting out violently against his friends. On one occasion, he violently attacked a kid named Martin and beat him severely, according to reports. He only stopped because his father drugged the two apart. And then on another occasion, a kid at a local swimming hole pushed his head underwater, and it really scared him. Well, later at a swimming pool, he attempted to drown that boy by holding his head underwater, and that assault was stopped by a lifeguard. By age 14, Jesperson reported that he was raped. Now, I don't know anything about this. It's unknown who the assailant was, but he still made that report. By 1973, he's graduating from high school, but he chooses not to go to college. Now, some reports suggest that it was because he was doing poorly in academics and school wasn't his thing. Others 
cite that he had an incredibly low IQ. In some areas, I read even as low as 102. Now, another area that Jesperson appeared to be struggling was in his relationship with girls. He didn't attend dances, and he didn't have any close girlfriends. It wasn't until after high school that he met and married a woman. And over the course of 14 years, the couple had three children. Now, during those 14 years, Jesperson was working as a truck driver, and he did that to support the family. Well, his wife suspected that he was having affairs while he was on the road. Does this remind you of Robert Ben Rhodes and his wife who thought he was out doing the same thing? Well, after 14 years, the couple divorced. It was about that time, Jeff Jesperson, who's 35 years old, standing six foot, seven inches high, weighing around 250 pounds, decided that he wanted to become a police officer and he tried to join the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. But he suffered an injury during training, which thankfully ended his chances of working in policing. Now, Jesperson's first known victim was a 23-year-old woman named Tanya Bennett. He met Tanya at a bar in Portland, Oregon. And as the night progressed, he ended up taking her to his home, where the two continued to party. Then at some point, Jesperson says they got into an argument, so he strangled her with a rope. Now, I don't know how all that comes together again without some pre-planning. But after watching her die, he reportedly got back in his car, drove back to the bar where they met, had a few more drinks, and I suspect maybe set himself for an alibi that uh, they didn't leave together or something. And then he went back to his home, got her body, loaded it into his vehicle, and then took her out near the Columbia River Gorge where he dumped her body. Now, as we talk about each of these eight victims, I'm going to let you fill in the blanks as to what you think preceded those violent attacks. He's going to say it was just some event that happened. I'm saying, uh-uh, it was pre-planned and meditated. I'm going to be watching for your answers down below on this one, though. Well, according to Jesperson, it would be two years before he killed again. But it was in August of 1992 that he raped and then murdered a woman named Claudia. She was found alongside a road near Blythe, California, and I don't think her last name has ever been determined. A month later, Jesperson killed a woman named Cynthia Lynn Rose at a truck stop in Turlock, California. Now, he says that she, Rose, was a prostitute working in the truck stop and that she entered his truck uninvited, offered sex, and then he got mad and killed her. So Jesperson says he sent a letter to police and this is the first time he put the smiley face on. And in that letter, he indicated that Rose was a prostitute and that he picked her up and murdered her. Now this conflicts with his story that she entered the truck uninvited. So that's kind of an interesting one too. His fourth victim was also a sex worker named Laurie Ann Pentland of Salem, Oregon. Now, murders two, three, and four happened in 1992, within months of each other. So I'm wondering, did he really go two years before the second murder occurred? Or were there some that he's not talking about or we're not hearing about? Anyway, Jesperson states that Pentland attempted to overcharge him for sex and did so in the course of this. And when she threatened to call police, he did the only thing he could do, murder her. His next victim was a woman named Patricia Skippel, who was found near Santa Nella, California in June of 1993. Now, I don't have a lot of information on this case, but it appears, according to Jesperson, that he didn't commit another murder for 14 months after that. Again, my question to you is, do you believe that? Now, I don't believe that he had 160 victims, but I suspect there are some that he's not talking about. May have been that they ended up being um, secondary victims, kind of a stage prop, or he failed in some way and didn't want to talk about it. But in August of 1994, Jesperson picked up, who would now be identified last week as Suzanne Yellenberg, who was uh, described as a drifter by those who knew her. 
Now, the initial contact spot was near Tampa, Florida, but her raped, beaten, and strangled body was discovered a month later near Holt, Florida, just off Interstate 10, and it would take 30 years to identify her name. That, again, just occurred a few days ago. His next known victim was Angela Serbrice, who was picked up in January of 1995 near Spokane, Washington. It was January 1995. Serbrice rode with Jesperson for about a week before he raped and strangled her. Now, some reports indicate that she was thinking she was hitching a ride to Indiana to meet a boyfriend, which obviously she never made. Well, then, after raping and strangling this woman, and remember, her name is Angela Serbrise. After he raped and murdered her, he did something that was so gruesome, it even took me a little bit surprised. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of warning in case you don't want to listen to this, because I think it's pretty darn gruesome. Jesperson tied her body face down underneath his truck. So her face was just inches from the road. And then he drove down the highway where she bounced along the road, completely disfiguring her face, her body to the point that there were no identifying marks. What a horrible thing. Yet he continued to get away with murder because he was going after these uh, victims who weren't uh, known to the predator. It was opportunistic killings, and that's very important. And I hope you'll go back and watch my video on the risk continuum where we talk about the uh, kind of predator that offends against somebody who's low risk versus someone living like these women apparently were in uh, high risk situations. Victim number eight, though, was completely different because it was a woman that he was dating and engaged to marry named Julianne Winningham. By this time, this rather organized killer had lost all of his ability to be patient and other things, and he became incredibly disorganized. Now, it was March of 1995, and we really wouldn't learn that he was the killer until he made another critical mistake at the same time that she was murdered. He picked up a woman that wasn't in any way connected Winningham had no idea that the man she was engaged to marry was a serial killer. But one night, while Jesperson was out on the road working, he came across a woman named Dawn Slagle, who was standing alone in a cold area holding a baby. She'd gotten into a fight and was just out getting some fresh air, trying to get away. Well, Jesperson approached Slagle, and he actually identified himself, giving his full name, and he offered to let her sit in his truck to warm up. Slagle said she had a really bad feeling about the interactions, and instead of following her feelings, she decided to jump in his truck anyway. Well, once in the truck, she regretted her decision as Jesperson immediately demanded some kind of sexual gratification. And when she refused, he grabbed her by the hair and slammed her face into the dashboard of the truck. Her baby started crying, and according to the woman, Jesperson's mood suddenly changed and he said to her, quote, don't ever get in a car with another person you don't know again, because it might be the last thing you do, close quote. And then he did something surprising. He let her out of the vehicle. Well, she reported him, it took a while for the police to put two and two together. And while investigating Winningham's death, uh, they talked to Jesperson, who refused to talk with them. But he was so overwhelmed with what was going on. I think, uh, knowing that the end was coming, he attempted suicide twice. He eventually turned himself in, hoping that by turning himself in, that the courts would be lenient on him. Well, while in custody, Keith Jesperson began confessing to all of his murders, including that 160-plus which he later recants. Now, during these confessions, it was learned that he'd also written a letter to his brother just a few days before turning himself in, where he confessed to murdering eight women over a five-year period of time. Jesperson is now serving three consecutive life sentences at the Oregon State Penitentiary, where he apparently 
is creating pen pal relationships with other serial killers, including accused serial killer Rex Heerman, calling them to repentance and telling them to confess. Well, last night I spent some time on News Nation with Ashley Banfield talking about the latest identification of Suzanne Gellenberg. It happened using forensic genetic genealogy, something that our good friend David Middleman over at Authram Labs has been talking about. He's been on Profiling Evil, and you can go back and listen to that interview. I really am proud of him. Well, after some discussion about Herman and Happy Face being pen pals from prison, we spoke about why it was so important to identify Suzanne 30 years later. Let's watch. Then he says, I used to write serial killers. Uh, I would say, you know, when somebody all of a sudden breaks in a case, I would send a letter. As the happy face killer, I would send a letter to a suspected serial killer, and I would tell them to confess. And I did that to Rex Heuerman, the Long Island suspected Gilgo Beach guy. And Rex wrote back. Rex Heuerman wrote back to the happy face killer. The request from the happy face killer was to come clean, be honest, and, you know, clear conscious. And the answer from Rex Heuerman was, I'll take it under advisement. I want to bring in Mike King. He's a retired homicide detective with 28 years law enforcement experience, host of the popular podcast Profiling Evil. I can see it in your face. I can see it in your face. The fact that they're pen pals, you can't make this stuff up. But I want you to tell me a little bit about Suzanne Chellenberg. Uh, It's not going to make a difference, Mike, to his sentence. How much of a difference does it make when a guy like you goes to a family that's been waiting for 30 years for justice and says, we have a solution. We know that we know who it is. What does it mean to them? Yeah, that, that's really the purpose in pursuing this and figuring out who this woman is, isn't it, Ashley, that you can go to the family and finally bring not not closure. I don't know that these things bring closure, but it certainly brings answers. It might enable a family to bury a loved one properly. But uh, this this is huge, and it's kind of a victory lap for law enforcement that finally we've been able to figure this out and sends a message that we don't give up. And thankfully, we got guys like Middleman who put Authram together and, and make this available. Yeah, I'm going to do a special on Authram because, you know, it's just popping up all the time now, and I want to do a deep dive and find out, okay, tell me everything about what you do down there in that uh, that building in Texas. So stay tuned for that. We then chatted about why prosecutors may have declined to go after Jesperson 29 years earlier when he confessed to these murders. And and the answer isn't really an easy one, but in my opinion, it boils down to a simple question. What would have been gained in this particular case by moving forward at that time? And what would be different today in moving forward? Let's watch that exchange. Question for you, though, Mike. I've covered cases before that have resulted in conviction where they did not find the dead body. They didn't actually find the body, but they knew the guy killed her. What happens if you find a body, you can't give an identity, and the guy has led you to it? Why couldn't they just convict him of it anyway 29 years ago? You know, we had this question a lot at the attorney general's office when I was there. And of course, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm on the investigative side. But we we came up with the realities that in this particular case, I think is the perfect example. They've got this predator in jail. He's staying in jail. He's never going to get out. Doing a capital murder case or at least a homicide case is incredibly expensive. And so to take some time and realize that you're not losing ground, you might gain more information, and you might be able to actually put a case together. But worst case is you're able here, they don't know who the family is until now. You're not you're not telling a family we're not going to do anything. You're you're holding on yeah. until you can hold out. And that's really what it's about, I think, is is finances and they're not losing anything because this guy's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere, and this won't make a heap of difference to him, but it will to them, like you said. Mike King, thank you. Love it. And I love the work you do. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thanks, Ashley. Great to be with you. Well, many of you are wondering why law enforcement would have sent Suzanne's body to the FBI lab for DNA analysis 30 years ago when they already knew who killed her, but they didn't quite know who Suzanne was. 
Think about this. Jesperson had already implicated his involvement in Suzanne's case back in 2008. So sending her body for DNA analysis was more about identifying the unidentified remains they had than identifying a killer. Once her DNA profile was determined, that profile was entered into the NDIS system. That's, that stands for National DNA Identification System, where it could be analyzed against all the other profiles that were emerging. And it's a growing database. The NDIS database is part of the larger CODIS database that you've probably heard about. CODIS is the combined DNA index system, and it looks for linkages in cases. But it really wasn't until genetic genealogy came about, this tying together the remains of known family members, that the data and the processes became miraculous, in my opinion. Cases like uh, the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, immediately come to mind when we think about this kind of technology. But it's also other kinds of cases that are coming forward at breakneck speed. In fact, it's being used today on a case that I um, spotlighted here on Profiling Evil in the case of a missing grandfather. And I'm going to put a link up here in case you want to go back and watch that. Because I'm hoping any day now, remains that have been recovered in that case will be determined to be him. Now, it might be frustrating. It might be really frustrating to some of you that some of the cases don't reach that punitive moment in court that we all want. But it's truly about resources, personnel, and budgets. But knowing who Suzanne Yellenberg is is really important, folks. I don't think I need to tell you that, but it allows family members to have answers that they might never have gotten otherwise. Now, in closing, I want to talk about Happy Face and Hurman. If you're like me, you're probably asking the question, why on earth is Happy Face riding Hurman? And why is that goofy guy responding to him? Well, I don't know how to take the interaction that's going on, but there's one thing that is certain to me. Happy Face Killer Jesperson has found a way to get his name back into the public spotlight. He's getting everything that he wants, attention, and a, a reminder of his whacked out legacy. So the question that I have for all of you is, what degree of effort are you willing to put forth to ensure your legacy? Some people might donate huge amounts of money so that they can have their name printed on the front of a building. On the other end of the spectrum, others might do the exact same thing, but do it quietly because it's the right thing to do. I mean, what's the reason for things that are legacy-based? Can you imagine, though, when we think about Jesperson, that, that you would want anyone to be reminded of the evil deeds that you've committed, the lives you've taken, the lives you've destroyed. For people like Keith Jesperson, Dennis Rader, the BTK serial killer, and many others, it's really about nothing more than legacy. Bragging rights, in my opinion, and taking the stage like he's done makes him once again relevant even if it's only for a season. Well, I hope you'll enter your comments down below, folks, and I hope you'll hit that like and subscribe button. If you ring the bell, you're going to get notified when we release other videos like this one. And frankly, it's the only way you're going to be notified, and that way you're going to know you're among the first to learn and know. Look for Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And folks, if you like podcasts, please check out Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. And please consider donating through PayPal or this median. Links can be found down below and your support is really appreciated. I'm heading out the door to the San Diego International Chiefs of Police Conference. It's going to go on for the next week. I hope I'll be able to do a live while I'm down there and I hope you'll join me if we do so. Thanks again for your support. And we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.